Joseph Haydn is considered one of the quintessential Austrian composers. Along with his contemporary Mozart and pupil Beethoven, his music would come to be considered the cornerstone of the first Viennese school of music. Haydn was not only one of the great composers of the late 18th century, but also one of the most innovative, as our modern understanding of the string quartet and symphony is often attributed to him. Being a composer who was seen as so inseparable from Viennese music and one of the founding fathers, per se, of Austro-German classical music, he is often a composer whose music formed a part of the German identity and nationalism. In fact, it was the melody of Haydn's hymn written for the Austrian Emperor Francis II that would eventually be used as the national anthem of Germany. But if we remove the German nationalist lens through which many 19th century German musicologists viewed Haydn, a different picture begins to appear. We cannot forget that Austria and Germany are not really the same thing, and while the Austrian Habsburg dynasty also reigned over the haphazardly administrated Holy Roman Empire, their primary concern was for their dominions that constituted the Austrian Empire, a vast multilingual empire that spanned from Central Europe far to the east, and even somewhat into modern Italy and into the Balkans. The multicultural aspect of the Austrian Empire is a very deep-seated characteristic of the Austrian identity. Being a German-speaking Austrian is something far different than being a German-speaking German. Haydn shared in this multilingual and cultural experience while spending a great deal of his life in Eisenstadt and Burgenland. This area of the Austrian Empire marked the boundary between the German-speaking world and the Hungarian and Slavic-speaking world. In Burgenland, Haydn was employed as Kapellmeister to the Hungarian prince Nikolaus Esterhazy. So, thus it is to be expected that Haydn was influenced by Hungarian music due to him spending a great deal of his life in close proximity to Hungary. This is heard in his Gypsy Trio, in which the final movement mimics the characteristics of the Hungarian dance known as the Verbunkos. But oddly, Haydn doesn't seem to be influenced as much as one might expect by Hungarian music. Instead, many of his famous melodies seem to have more similarities with Croatian folk music. These similarities were noted by the 19th century Croatian musicologist Franjo Kuć, who was an expert in Croatian folk music. I don't know if you've looked at a map, but Hungary is a lot closer to Burgenland, Austria than Croatia is. So what gives? What's going on here? Kuach's theories rely on the fact that, although Burgenland borders Hungary, it was also and is still home to a minority of Croatians. So, how did a minority of Croatians end up in Burgenland, hundreds of miles away from their traditional homeland? To answer this question, we have to go back a few hundred years still to the 16th century, when the Ottoman Turks gained control over most of Croatia. During this time, King Ferdinand I of Austria granted land and independent ecclesiastical rights to the refugees of the Croatian towns pillaged by the Turks. Many of these land grants were in Burgenland around the principalities of Eisenstadt and Oedenburg. And even after the Austrians retook Croatia from the Ottoman Turks, the Burgenland Croats remained in what had become their new homeland, but with them remained their language, culture, and most importantly for the sake of this video, their music. So thus, there is nothing controversial about Haydn being in contact with Croatian folk music, just as much, if not more so, than with Hungarian music. So thus, it isn't a stretch to imagine Haydn being confronted often with Croatian culture, although he himself never set foot in Croatia proper. So let's now entertain Kuic's theories and show just some of the numerous examples he put forward in the 19th century. First, let's look at the beginning of Haydn's Cassation in G major. 
What's characteristic about this opening melody is the alteration between bars divided into six beats and bars of four beats. A very similar melody and rhythmic characteristic is found in the Croatian drinking song Nikai na Cvetu, albeit in a slower tempo. Nikai na Cvetu, In the finale of Haydn's 104th symphony, in D major, we are treated to this very unique, almost pastoral melody. Let's now look at the folk song, Oi Jelena, which was popular among Croatian communities in and around Edinburgh and Eisenstadt. In Haydn's 103rd symphony in E flat major, the second movement has two melodies which bear striking resemblances to popular Croatian songs from the region surrounding Udenburg. The initial theme in minor, is very reminiscent of the song Na Travniku. The second theme in major share similarities to the song Your Postaye. In the same symphony, Haydn employs this melody in the final movement. It, like the two melodies of the second movement, is similar to a popular Slavic folk tune called Die Vojčica Potokazi. Kuac makes some very convincing arguments, as he shows not just these, but many other similarities between Haydn's melodies and Croatian folk tunes. But perhaps the most startling similarity is this. Let's take a listen to the Croatian song Start Se Jezim. Doesn't that sound familiar? It kind of sounds like the opening to this. Gott erhalte Franz den Kaiser, unseren guten Kaiser Franz. And now that I've brought you full circle, I wish to end this video with the critiques later musicologists have levied against Kuach's theories. See, Kuach didn't just theorize that Haydn was influenced by Croatian music, but that the reason for this wasn't just that Haydn lived and worked in close proximity with Croatians, but that he himself was of Croatian descent. He theorized that the name Haydn was of Croatian origin, but this has since been disproven. Unfortunately, the exhaustive research of Ernst Fritz Schmidt that proved Haydn was of German ancestry was done during the 1930s. And the 1930s was infamous in Germany for the crackpot research proving the Aryan ancestry of composers. 
which means timing was unfortunate, but nonetheless his proofs are now accepted by most of the musicological community. Oftentimes you have to read many sources and come to your own conclusion. Clearly, Kuach's theories are somewhat infected by 19th century nationalism. It wasn't enough for Kuach that Haydn respected the melodies of Croatian music so much that he inserted them into his own compositions, but that Haydn had to have been a Croatian himself. But nonetheless, Kuach's theories on borrowed folk music are extensive and convincing enough. Another point of contention was that Haydn didn't really borrow folk melodies at all. The French musicologist Marie Boblier, who published under the male pseudonym of Michel Brenet, postulated the following. Why should not the terms of the proposition be reversed? During the time Haydn lived at Eisenstadt or Esterhase, when his music resounded day and night in the castle and gardens of his prince, why should not his own airs, or scraps at least, of his own melodies have stolen through the open windows and remained in the memories, first of the people whose duty it was to interpret them, and then of the scattered population of the surrounding country? So basically she suggests that Haydn didn't borrow anything, but rather the community surrounding Eisenstadt borrowed from Haydn. I for one find this theory incredibly elitist and snobby. It regrettably removes Haydn from humanity in my opinion. I'm sure the intention of Marie Bobillier was meant to insist that Haydn was such a genius that he didn't need to borrow from folk music, and that the Croatian residents surrounding Eisenstadt were so enamored with his music that several folk songs sprang into being due to Haydn. This bothers me, as I think it demonstrates a type of elitism and a regrettable side to some musicologists. It is hard for some musicologists, especially those who attend elite academies and spend their lives buried in books, to accept that perhaps someone like Haydn would have actually enjoyed, respected, and loved folk music. I think many intellectuals find it hard to imagine someone of a stature such as Haydn actually respecting folk music. And while yes, Haydn lived a privileged life rubbing shoulders with royalty and earning respect from some of Europe's most important sovereigns of the era, he also came from incredibly humble backgrounds. Haydn's parents were not well off, so Haydn's early years were spent amongst commoners. His mother, Anna Maria, was a cook, and his father, Matthias, a wheelwright. But Haydn's father was also a folk musician, who learned to play the harp by ear, and often the Haydn family would sing folk songs together. This is what made Haydn who he was, not the courts and monarchs that employed him, but rather the humble hearth of his upbringing. Perhaps this is what makes Haydn's music so endearing, for behind its nobility can be found the salt of the earth. Thank you.